Well, first of all, let me of course also thank uh, the organizers and especially Daphne uh, for uh, inviting us here. Uh, uh, for me personally, it's a great honor and it's a very interesting uh, context and, and a challenge. Uh, I would like to speak um, on a subject that is very near but still something else than the paper I handed in. But, uh, I didn't even see it, so it doesn't matter. Okay. That's, that's, that's great, and then, then this is a, a great situation for both. So the title of my uh, lecture would be, uh, will be uh, History for Reconciliation? Question mark. An overview of critic and a critical analysis of some recent uh, initiatives on what I will call historical dialogue, shared history, and uh, historical reconciliation. Now, in January uh, this year, 2014, uh, the role of shared historical narratives uh, for peace building and reconciliation was chosen as a central theme uh, for an extensive open debate in the United Nations uh, Security Council under the presidency of uh, Jordan. Now, in a concept note, um, the representative of Jordan argued that the United Nations would fail in forging reconciliation uh, among ex-combatants as long as it didn't understand or fully see that reconciliation should always be based on, and I quote the representative of Jordan, a shared historical understanding of the past. Now, according to uh, the representative, uh, Prince Al Hussein, Al Hussein of Jordan, and I quote him again, unresolved historical narratives pose a major threat for international peace and security. And I quote him again, divergent historical narratives should be recognized as, and I use his words, leading causes of war. Jordan therefore asked the Security Council, and this is interesting, to consider creating a United Nations Historical Advisory Team, which could assist states to recover documents, set up archives, and historical commissions when the guns draw silent. Now, it isn't sure, it is actually far from sure, whether such a historical advisory commission by the UN will ever materialize. Uh, the ID seems sensitive to most of the delegations in the UN Security Council and in the discussion that followed among all the different uh, nations historical reconciliation seemed far off. Um, several Asian countries uh, charged against uh, Japan for not uh, repenting enough for uh, the crime against the comfort women. Uh, Armenia and Turkey accused each other of twisting historical facts and several countries uh, put uh, the debt of colonialism and imperialism on the table. Moreover, some countries argued that it would not be wise and quite dangerous to revisit old historical narratives, while others, such as Kenya and Chad, uh, Chad uh, argued that inequality and social justice, social injustice, or poverty and impunity are actually the prime global causes of conflict rather than diverging historical narratives. And finally, the representative of France uh, argued that indeed, and I quote them, it is not history that causes conflicts, it is conflicts that fashion history in its own image, end of quote. Now, I personally have long uh, kind of sidestepped the, 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 the concept of reconciliation, although I've been working on truth commissions, truth and reconciliation commissions, historical commissions and so on. Well, I, uh, uh, for a long time, uh, I still think that the concept is difficult and often vague, and sometimes it somehow collides, in some cases at least, with my uh, 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 feeling of, of what is just. Uh, yet, due to these debates and the importance that clearly the concept of historical reconciliation is getting, I do think that it should be taken seriously and that it deserves a, a serious uh, analysis. Uh, yet, before starting, I do have to say, and uh, this might be disappointing uh, to some of you, that I will not consider the question of the actual effectivity of using history for reconciliation. I don't see myself fit uh, for this job and I also haven't found a lot of studies, scientific studies that uh, give me, uh, let's say, co 
many convincing results on that level. I think reconciliation, to measure that in a uh, quantitative sense, is a very, very difficult thing to do. So I'll, I'll not try to do it. What I will try to do is look at those historiographies, those pieces of history writing that claim to work towards reconciliation without judging whether it works or not, but just take them and see what different approaches there are, uh, what uh, uh, possible risks, challenges and questions are. Uh, so that is a little quite minimal but uh, achievable goal, I think, I said for myself. I also have to say that I am not a specialist. Uh, I am a theorist of history, uh, but not a specialist in reconciliation. So I see myself as an interested observer, or to mock the, the, the UN uh, terminology, a special rapporteur who has been walking around in all these strange countries, and I'll tell about it to you. And, uh, and I hope we, we, we can get to a kind of discussion there. Uh, who uses the concept of, of historical narratives for reconciliation, shared history, historical dialogue? Well, the issue has certainly not only popped up in the uh, Security Council. Actually, in the UN itself, it is present in many other spheres, institutional spheres of the UN. Um, in 2013 and 2014, uh, two substantial and very important reports on historical and memorial narratives in divided societies were submitted to uh, the General Assembly of the UN as well as the Human Rights Council. Uh, the reports were written by uh, Farida Shahid, uh, the pa Pakistani uh, UN uh, Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights. I will come back to that. And in September this year, uh, the reports was, were indeed used for a broad discussion within the Human Rights Council. So, you see that they're really, really uh, influential later. Now, in the UN, in UNESCO, uh, the idea of promoting, I quote, promoting shared history and memory for reconciliation, end of quote, has been around for quite a long time. Uh, yet, recently, it becomes more and more explicit in a series of UNESCO projects. I uh, think of the General and Regional Histories project, uh, but also think of the project uh, Roots of Dialogue, and especially uh, the Slave Root project, uh, which is based on the idea, and I quote here, that ignorance and concealment of major historical events constitutes an obstacle to mutual understanding, reconciliation, and cooperation among peoples. So that is the UN and UNESCO. Another uh, intergovernmental organization where the issue of historical reconciliation has become very central is uh, the Council of uh, Europe, which is not to be confused with the Council of the European Union. Now, this body, the Council of Europe, has made several recommendations. It cannot make laws, but it can make uh, recommendations on the way, uh, on ways to turn history and history teaching into, and I quote, tools to support peace and reconciliation, end of quote. The idea has been put into practice by the Council of Europe in uh, the project Shared History <coughs> for a Europe without, without Dividing Lines which is a publication uh, that, uh, and a project that ran from 2010 to 2014. So very recent projects we're speaking about. Um, historical reconciliation is also promoted by a large series of NGOs. Uh, um, of course, um, um, we, we have uh, the, the NGO that, that so gently and uh, generously host this uh, conference, uh, which is the, historic, um, the Association for Historical Dialogue and Research. Uh, but there are many others uh, who work in the field. Um, I think one of the most uh, well-known internationally is uh, the Peace Institute of, in the Middle, uh, Peace Research Institute in the Middle East, PRIME. Uh, I, I will call this uh, the, the, the short PRIME here. Uh, Peace Research Institute in the Middle East. Well, this uh, NGO cre um, coordinated uh, the innovative program Learning from Each Other's Historical Narratives in Israel and uh, Palestine. And this program brought together a substantial group of Jewish and Palestinian teachers to promote the technique of what they call dual uh, or parallel narratives as means to promote uh, reconciliation. Uh, another Yet quite different example is the uh, textbook that was coordinated uh, by uh, France and Germany, which is called Histoire Geschichte, uh, 
with double title, <coughs> and which has been published, been publishing since 2006, a series of histories of Europe, uh, shared histories of Europe since antiquity. Um, now, one of the most extensive projects of using history for reconciliation is doubtlessly the so-called Scholars Initiative in the former Yugoslavia. It ran between 2001 and 2011 and it involved more than, according to them, 300 academics. And the aim was to, and I call them, expose myths and resolve historical controversies. End quote. Um, we can also think of the uh, organization Institute for Historical uh, Justice and Reconciliation, which is uh, based in The Hague, which was established in 2004 and has a, a series of smaller scale projects also focused on using history for reconciliation. And they uh, say that they promote reconciliation by using, and I quote them here, the innovative and effective methodology of shared narratives. End of quote. They up to now have been focusing mostly on Israel Palestine, the former Yugoslavia, and uh, Armenia Turkey. Now, among the more odd initiatives, from my perspective at least, is uh, the Working Group on Historical Reconciliation from the Euro-Atlantic Security Initiative, uh, which uh, was created in 2009 and which claims to bring together former policy makers, diplomats, generals, specifically generals, it seems, and business leaders uh, from Russia, the USA, Canada and Europe in order to allow the region, and I quote them, allow the region to leave its past behind and start to build a more secure future, end of quote. So we see the concept is used uh, by a very broad uh, uh, um, fellowship, let's say, uh, from hardcore security thinking uh, to uh, NGOs working in the field, uh, but also in The Hague and so on. Um, now that I have given a very brief overview of the sort of uh, organizations that use the, the words, the terminology, and take initiatives in the field, let us raise two important questions, uh, which is important for a historian. That is, is the current focus on historical uh, reconciliation, is it new? Uh, is it something new, historically seen? Uh, and where do the concepts like shared history, historical reconciliation, where do they come from? Well, the idea certainly has long antecedents. Um, the notion that a certain share, sharing of history is important thanks, to create a common identity or to combat extreme extremism, nationalism, is for example a central feature in the European Cultural Convention of 1954, uh, which obliged its signatories um, to promote among its own nationals to the study of the languages, history and civilization of the other uh, participating countries. So you had to learn history and civilization of the country around you uh, to take part in the European Cultural Convention. Similarly, the UNESCO has already, uh, from shortly after the Second World War, been promoting, setting up and supervising so-called uh, bilateral commissions, so uh, commissions that were made out of historians from two countries to revise textbooks together. So the idea is all in that sense. And of course, another a very important institutional carrier, let's say, of the idea of historical reconciliation are the so-called truth and reconciliation commissions, which have been very influential, we, which started around about the early 1980s, but in the meanwhile have been established in more than 30 countries all over the world. So the above examples suggest that there is nothing new under the sun if it comes to historical reconciliation. But I think this conclusion would be uh, misguided. Actually I believe that there are some new features in the discourse and practice and that they uh, occur on both a quantitative level as a qualitative level. Quantitatively, I can be short, I think that there's much more speech and initiative involving the notion of using history for reconciliation. Uh, I, I cannot prove this here, but I think it, it would easily be done. Uh, on a qualitative level, which is more interesting to me, I believe that there are also some quite new aspects uh, first, it should be noticed 
that the idea of historical reconciliation and shared history is increasingly seen as an exercise in sharing historical and memorial narratives. And I will come back to that. But remember the idea of a narrative, which is uh, a specific idea, exchanging narratives. Secondly, and related, the older idea that reconciliation would mainly be served by finding objective truth and increasing, uh, has increasingly become mixed or even sometimes replaced by a stress on the importance of dialogue and subjective perspectives on history, or better, multi-perspectivity as a source for reconciliation. So, current discourses and practices seem to revolve around an ambiguous mix of, on the one hand, positivist or neo-positivist terminology, and on the other hand, more postmodern or post-postmodern, uh, to use a phrase from Nancy, uh, Nancy Partner, uh, concepts and terminology. So there's a certain tension which I would like to explore. And of course some projects lean much more to one, one extreme, uh, some to another extreme, and there are many, many uh, in between. I'll just give three examples. Um, and this brings me actually to the following question. Can we actually speak about the rise of a new historiographical genre? or a practice? Is it a, a, a common practice, is it one, one historiography? Let's say the historiography or the style or the genre of reconciliation historiographies. Right? Is there such a thing as a reconciliation historiography? And what would be the underlying conceptual frame? Now, this question clearly asks for a nuanced uh, answer. In a minimalist way, one could of course always speak about the rise of reconciliation historiography in the sense of a collection of history, uh, histories written with the common aim of promoting reconciliation. But that's of course very minimalist. If one expects a historiography or a genre to be based on a substantial level of shared epistemology, uh, shared ideas of what is historical knowledge, shared visions on what reconciliation means, and shared techniques, narrative techniques, to bring reconciliation into existence. Well, if one expects this, no. Then I think the answer is no. There is no such a thing as one reconciliation historiography. There are many different subgroups and genres. <coughs> Let me explain this in more detail by starting with two examples of extremes on the continuum, and then an example of an in-between. Well, on the one hand, there are those initiatives that believe in the power of objective scientific truth, the unmasking of myth, and resolving, resolving of contradictory historical narratives as a means to heal wounds and bridge cultural division. Uh, this approach can, for example, be found in the above-mentioned uh, Scholars Initiative, remember 300 academics involved, and actually, they, they say that the problem of the former Yugoslavia is, and I quote them, that unfortunately, is that each national group employs a different array of facts, many of them either distorted or blatantly untrue. The resulting the divergent uh, recitations of history have divided nations by sowing mistrust, resentment, and hatred. End of quote. So, how do they try to solve this? Well, they want to bridge uh, the cognitive, what they call the cognitive gap between the two groups, <coughs> or, or several groups in this case. And how can this be done? Well, they claim that this can be done because of one, the indisputable scientific credentials of their scholars, of their 300 scholars, then the transparent impartiality of their method, <coughs> And the fact that they all share the same method, and the fact that they are dispassionate, distant, and that they use key documentary evidence, so focus on documentary evidence, written sources, let's say, right? not using or not a lot <coughs> using oral histories, oral testimony. So that's their solution. Uh, they don't say it always works, uh, but they do believe it will work in many cases. In other words, the initiative wants to, and now I quote them, this is important. They want to de-emphasize the importance of subjective differences in emphasis or in interpretation in favor of making objective judgments, objective judgments about the admissibility and validity of evidence 
that can establish a single incontrovertible factual matrix. So they want to make a basic factual matrix, which then nobody can discuss anymore. And one of the project leaders uh, uh, succinctly describes their approach as positivist. <clears throat> so that's on the one hand. On the other hand, there are those projects which primarily believe in the importance of what they call multi-perspectivity, and which stress that narrative differences mainly reflect subjective differences in interpretation, which are often equally legitimate. Now, these initiatives generally do not have a lot of faith in the possibility of resolving narrative contradictions or bridging cognitive gaps. Rather, they try to promote reconciliation by illustrating the different existing narratives and making them known to both parties or different parties. Now, the clearest example of such an approach is, is I think, the textbook by Prime, uh, Learning Each Other's Historical Narratives. Now, this project was innovative because it presented two parallel narratives in two columns, uh, which are separated by a third white column on which the pupils can write their own notes. So you get a textbook with, on the one hand, the Palestinian narrative, on the other hand, the Israeli, and in the middle, the, the space for the pupils to write their own visions. Uh, the, narratives, um, the narratives were provided uh, by uh, teams of, uh, of teachers, which were supervised by two professional historians, uh, and the project ran between 2002 until 2009. And the authors, and this is important, the authors painstakingly attempted to give each of the narratives <coughs> equal space and stress their equal legitimacy. So for them, both narratives were equally legitimate. No attempts are made to bridge the narratives or judge their ultimate truthfulness. They call this method dual or parallel narratives and stress that it could, and I quote, allow both people <coughs> to move beyond the one-dimensional identification with their own narrative and become equipped to acknowledge, understand and respect without necessarily accepting the other uh, narrative. So they didn't say, you should accept the other's narrative, you should respect it, you should know it, and you should acknowledge it. Acknowledge, that's important, I come back to that. <clears throat> Yet, they also immediately warned that this could be a very painful process, and they use a Freudian vision on mourning, and they consider it a process of mourning, because what you have to do is let go some of your uh, securely feeling antagonistic uh, views. Now, as said above, these are examples of two uh, outspoken positions. There are also examples of uh, initiatives that take an in-between position. And one of these in initiatives comes from the uh, Institute for Historical Justice and Research in The Hague, and who, which sponsored a book called Two Sides of the Coin, Independence and Nakba, 1948, which indeed focuses on the war between Arabs and Israeli and the Nakba, the, the catastrophe for the Palestinians in 1948. <clears throat> so, two sides of the coin. Uh, and it was published in 2011 by the Palestinian and Israeli historians Adel Mana and Moti Polani. Now, much like the historical narratives projects by Prime, Mana and Polani stress the importance of narratives for reconciliation on the one hand, and similarly, they try to represent two competing narratives on the same events, namely the 1948 episode. Now, there are, however, very remarkable differences between, on the one hand, the prime parallel narratives and the project Two Sides of the Coin. Instead of placing two narratives side by side on separate pages, Mana and Gulani choose to mix the narratives write one text in which they constantly shift perspective. They point out that this results in a text that is occasionally internally contradictory, but that they choose not to indicate these contradictions and also not to indicate whose narrative is whose. So they don't say whether they're now or then speaking as a Palestinian, speaking as an Israeli. No, they don't do that. Um, now, we should of course remark that uh, Mana and Golani have much more space for cognitive experiment, because they're not writing a textbook, they're writing a book for grown-ups, and they're writing a book for mostly, I believe, uh, college historians, so they can do some other things. Yet, I believe that the choice for a mixed narrative 
instead of the parallel narrative, and thus the choice not to present two parallel narratives that are divergent yet internally coherent, that there's more to that choice than just uh, pragmatics. While the prime authors empathically uh, treat the Palestinian and Israeli narratives as different yet equally legitimate, Mana and Golani seem to treat them as equally illegitimate. Although they recognize that historians sometimes use narrative elements in their work, Mana and Golani make a very, very strict differentiation between what they call historiography on the one hand, which should be research-based, <coughs> precise, and directed at exclusively the past, and on the other hand what they call historical narrative, which they believe, uh, they argue, primarily focus on the present and the, and the future. It's just even not about the past for them. It's actually unhistorical. That's a little strange, but historical narratives, according to them, are thoroughly able to historical. Now, historical narratives could therefore never be seen as a substitute or even competition for historiography. <coughs> Consistent with this view, Mana and Golani stress that they did not try to correct the narratives and, I quote them, found it unnecessary to confront the narratives as historians. End of quote. The authors claim to have made use of their historical expertise only to give, and I quote them, some semblance of order to the narratives and to provide some chronological markers. Now, the author's vision is clearly reflected in the composition, the overall composition of the book, uh, which is subdivided in two sorts of chapters, which they on the one hand called historical chapters and narrative chapters. And the historical chapters do not contextualize the narrative chapters in the sense of reflecting on them or explaining them, but rather describe the chronological periods that become before and come after the periods described in the narrative chapters. And the historical chapters, so to speak, chronologically contain or isolate the narrative chapters. And they are kind of a buffer zone. You have the narrative chapters and then a kind of a buffer zone of historical chapters around it. And the few times that they do decide to intervene as historians in the narrative chapters, they do so in a different typographic, uh, typographic font to make sure that you clearly know, oh, oh, this is historical, this is true. So there could not be no, no confusion. Now that we have given some illustrations of concrete cases of reconciliation historiography, let us sum up what diverse positions we have encountered. As remarked, we have encountered different epistemic positions and different visions of what is knowledge. The positivist one, uh, which believes in absolute truth, and the more postmodernist inspired one who believes in multi-prospectivity, interpretations, and is sometimes really uh, even relative. <laughs> Now, in terms of narrative strategies, we could analytically differentiate between what I've called these um, bridging narratives. And bridging can always happen in two ways, we should differentiate further. That is one, which is a kind of deconstructive, uh, equalizing bridging, namely you deconstruct the myths of the two parts, parties to the conflict. That's a, a form of bridging. Another form of bridging, which is often combined with the first one, is writing, constructing so-called what they call positive histories, which means focusing on aspects in the past that were shared, common uh, dialogues, uh, exchanges, cultural exchanges, and so on, positive histories. So they're both bridging narratives. On the other hand, you have those narratives who do not try to bridge, uh, which again can be subdivided in two kinds of uh, uh, um, techniques, one called parallel narratives, the other mixed narratives. Right. Now, it should be clear that these different epistemologies and narrative strategies are not politically neutral. Specific approaches can be based on practical limitations, uh, but also on political considerations. It is definitely no coincidence that the examples of the bridging narrative that I gave come from the former Yugoslavia, and there are others examples, and that the parallel narratives uh, and the mixed narratives and, in a sense, non-interventionist narratives, approaches, come from Israel and Palestine. The authors of the prime project, for example, the Peace Institute, uh, Research Institute for the Middle East, make a thoroughly political claim when explaining why they opted for separate 
narrative rather than a bridging narrative. And I quote them here, this is a very important quote, so... We feel that at this point of historical and political development, our societies, in our societies, that both sides need first to establish a two-state solution and the Palestinian state. And therefore present their own narrative separately to feel secure and give the other side the opportunity to know it. Well, this is a outright political claim by Prime, the authors of Prime. Now the authors of two sides of a coin, Mal uh, uh, Golani and Mana, they make a different political claim. They argue that reconciliation between Palestinians and Israeli can only happen if they aim for coexistence rather than justice. And their choice for a mixed narrative seems to be closely related to, to this political stance. That is what I believe. In one, uh, if one takes a closer look at the narrative techniques used by Amana and Golani in the so-called narrative chapters as well as in their historical chapters, it can be noticed that they are often stressing the absence of choice for the contemporary actors, the eternal repetition of violence and counter-violence, in other words, the tragic once again uh, dominates over the more hopeful never again. In classical white, in Hayden White, uh, in, in Hayden White's terms, one could indeed speak about the overall structure of the book as a tragic narrative. Now, why do I say tragic? Well, uh, and not satirical. Well, it's not satirical. It's not ironic, because as a, a tragical story, it it ends up bad, but it ends up with a lesson that is learned. And the lesson that is learned, and it is literally uh, claimed in the epilogue, is that Palestinians and Israeli actually have no choice but reconcile. And I would add for specificity that they mean that there's no choice but reconcile with the idea of giving up of, uh, uh, on the struggle for uh, justice. Now, up to now, we have been focused on re focusing on relatively concrete political motives and effects I do believe that on a more profound level, uh, these different epistemic and narrative strategies also relate to different philosophical and legal ways of thinking that are found in human rights discourse. Human rights discourse that is nowadays an extremely influential uh, discourse of uh, view. Um, now, one has to understand that historiography enters in two ways in human rights discourse. One of the ways that it enters is in the thinking about impunity, the struggle against impunity, and more exactly in what has been codified as the right to know or the right to truth. Uh, this has been developed uh, first in the Inter-American Court uh, on cases of forced disappearance. In the case of forced disappearance, truth is extremely important. And from there it became, it made, let's say, legal headway in two important UN reports by special rapporteurs uh, Louis Joannet and Diane uh, Orenthal. Now, in Joannet's uh, report, the right to know is explicitly defined as both a right to individual and historical truth. That is very important to historians. And I quote them, it is also a guard against the perversions of history that go under the names of revisionism and negationism. End of quote. Now, that's the one side, the right to truth, which is now a, a internationally recon more and more recon recognized uh, right. Now, on the other hand, there's also the approach to historical narratives from the human rights discourse or what they call cultural rights. Now, in this context, the two recent uh, uh, reports by the UN rapporteur Farida Shahid, which I mentioned in the beginning, on historical narratives and memorials and so on, well, they are of key importance here. Now, one of the most remarkable features of these reports is that they do not at all stress the importance of truth uh, and historical knowledge for reconciliation. Actually, truth is just not mentioned. Or it is mentioned when uh, it is uh, mentioned with a capital T to say that you shouldn't claim truth to be your, on your side, right? But, um, but the, shift, the, the emphasis shifts to historical narratives rather than history, historical narratives, and historical interpretation. And Shahid especially stresses the allegedly critical 
and emancipatory potential of what she calls multi-perspectivism and she speaks even about what she calls a right to historical perspective <coughs> this is a really really important notion a right to historical perspective now history teaching according to Shahid should be based on the standards of academic historiography and it should also offer critical resistance against prejudice and stereotypes yet she mentions that one should also acknowledge that and I quote history <coughs> is always subject to different interpretations and that, I use her words, historical narratives are viewpoints that by definition are partial Shahid therefore recommends that history teaching should adopt a multi-perspective approach and I quote her, taking into account the right to freedom of opinion and expression, the right to information and education, academic freedoms and the right of individuals and groups to access their cultural heritage and that of others. Shahid therefore comes to the conclusion which would be hard to digest for more positivist minded historians namely, and I quote, that the right of children to develop their own historical perspective throughout education is to be considered an integral part of the right to education. So we get a totally different discourse which is about the right to heritage, the right to education, and for historians, really important, the right to historical perspective. So we have the right to truth and the right to historical perspective. Now, let me... Um, go to some questions, risks and dilemmas. First of all, I think I should start where I started, in the UN Security Council. Uh, there I am most scared, in the sense that I believe that if something is used in the Security Council, it is very prone to become uh, appropriated for uh, geopolitical reasons. And this is especially the case when diverging narratives, remember uh, Prince Al Hussein, are identified as root causes of war and conflict. Uh, this analysis can, see, uh, can indeed take the attention away from other more structural causes of conflict such as socio-economical inequality, underdevelopment, economic exploitation, failing states and occupied territories. <coughs> Moreover, uh, in this context of continuing structural injustice, we should always ask the very difficult, I admit, the question whether the demand for historical reconciliation, because it of course can become a demand if it's in international uh, atmosphere, uh, it can be demanded of certain uh, countries. Well, whether this demand is just in relation to continuing this structural injustice. Here we could think of the uh, parable which the filmmaker Lars von Trier uh, told at the occasion of being awarded the Peace Prize by the organization Peace for Cinema which he refused, and he refused it by sending in a uh, video message and a message uh, uh, compared the humanity or the people on earth to two tribes living in the desert one tribe in a country with a well, with water, and the other without it and then he got, went on, now he said, uh, he was very cynical uh, the desert tribe around the well wants peace, and they like the peace price the desert tribe that doesn't have water uh, or doesn't have a well, they don't want peace, they want water. <laughs> now, I don't want to be cynical, but I think there's some, some, we should think about this. Now, even beyond the relation with continuing structural injustice, one can pose the question about the ethical political implications of some of the basic concepts in the discourse of historical reconciliation. Take, for example, does again the tension between the notions of narrative conflict and multi-perspectivity on the one hand and the right to historical perspective also on this hand, let's say, and on the other hand the right to truth and the right of victims to be recognized in their view. <coughs> That's another established right, acknowledgement, recognition. Now, the narrative approach does not seem to be able to deliver on its promise of acknowledgement or recognition. Victims do not want their testimony to be acknowledged as narrative or as perspective, uh, even, in, even if it's happening in an empathically respectful way. And that's sad to say, but they want actually their, their uh, <coughs> testimony to be uh, recognized as truth. Uh, Darton has to, uh, spoken about, in this context about the victim's Rankian rage. And they're going back to Rankian and they have some neo-positivist rage. <coughs> Now, similarly, victims generally do not want their suffering and pain 
to be recognized, but rather wanted to be recognized as suffering and pain resulting from specific and real injustices. And in this context, one can think of the South African uh, survivor group, uh, Kulum, uh, Kulumani support group, which openly rebelled against what they call the psychologizing and pathologizing discourse of the Truth Commission there, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and also of the professional therapists and psychologists that were helping them out. Now, again, it's not that I want to uh, be cynical here because I, of course, as a historian, also know that the other approach, the absolute truth approach and the demythologizing approach, is, is just, um, it can help in certain contexts and with certain blatant lies, I do believe so. On the other hand, we know as historians quite well that when it comes to more nuanced uh, narrative conflicts, let's say, and more complex ones, that it, it, it's hardly potent historiography to really solve these things. Uh, now, then let me uh, offer two more problems. Um, even if we make abstractions of the problems of continuing structural injustice and the victim's so-called ranking rage, there are some prevailing values or cultural convention within most of the reconciliation historiographies which render them, in my opinion, not neutral or even when different narratives are carefully given equal space and attention. Uh, the prime authors, the ones of the parallel narratives, they had a very clear insight in this problem when they remarked that, and I want to ask attention for this quote, I know quoting is not a good thing in lectures, but they're so uh, clear, um, to quote them, they said, the Israeli and Palestinian narratives are not symmetrical in their internal construction. So they're legitimate both, but they're not they are not symmetrical in their internal construction and one cannot expect them to be at the current stage. The Palestinian narrative is much more monolithic in its internal structure, representing the Palestinians' need to develop their independent statehood. The Israeli narrative, after 55 years of statehood, is a bit more self-reflexive and self-critical." Now, elsewhere, also the prime project leaders remarked that the teams of, of teachers had some uh, discussions on the level of detail in which to describe painful events. Now, this is a thoroughly narrative dis uh, discussion. This, what kind of, how do you describe suffering? Now, these differences can indeed clearly be observed if one reads the two narratives in the book. And one can see, for example, that the Israeli narrative, for example, makes much more use of techniques of, for example, reflexive distancing, uh, inclusion of the other's perspective as perspective, that is very important. And generally sticks more closely to the factual language, which Hayden Whitewood could be calling uh, the, the genre of realism. Now, both issues are, of course, highly relevant, uh, given the, the great stress in reconciliation historiographies on the meta values of reflexivity and multi-perspectivity, success or failure to live up to these ideals delivers great advantage or disadvantage in getting one's narrative uh, recognized. Similarly, reconciliation historiographies often exhibit to a certain taboo, uh, a certain taboo on all too vivid and emotionally charged literary and literary and visual representations or evocations of suffering and violence. Actually, the controlling of emotions, literal terms, controlling of emotions uh, is put forward as an explicit goal or objective of re reconciliatory uh, history teaching by the Council of Europe. And actually, uh, Shahid, for example, in her reports, mentions uh, under the, um, <coughs> under the uh, label of manipulation in textbooks, the use of all too violent pictures and all too violent uh, descriptions. So they, she really sees this as manipulation, right? Now, of course, if we agree that um, the definition of what an emotion is and what controlled emotion is and wild emotion is, is cultural, and that, the, uh, that certain uh, narrative genres are cultural and even depictions of violence are cultural, then we no know that certain cultures will fare will be less adapted to the technique of parallel narratives than others. So this is, that's why I believe it's not neutral. 
And finally, we should keep in mind that the writing of history in the service of great values such as reconciliation and democracy, which I of course support, still constitute a new, a new instrumentalism of historiography. And one can welcome this new instrumentalism, certainly in the struggle against nationalism and xenophobic instrumentalism, but nevertheless one should really be careful with that kind of instrumentalism. Now, a very short conclusion, which is more of a, a disclaimer. Um, let me conclude that I do not want to be cynical or pessimistic. Uh, I do deliver these criticisms in an attempt to be constructive. Uh, I primarily list these questions and challenges uh, for constructive uh, reasons. And I also want to stress again that there are many different types of reconciliation historiographies that, and that they are still being pioneered and that they therefore legitimately ask for uh, readers and commentators like myself to uh, willfully enter what they call the experimental mood uh, of their approach to history and education reform. And I think we should, we should try to do this. And moreover, I also want to state that I have a great and profound respect for the personal courage of many uh, of these scholars and others involved in, in, in these uh, uh, initiatives. Um, I want to end up with this uh, this day. Okay.